year. So as you've just heard there, we are going to be recording the session um, just so we can put it up on, um, on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so hopefully everyone's happy with that. Um, so welcome to our offer holder webinar, um, focusing around the topic of accommodation and the local area. My name is Ruta. I am part of the student recruitment team here at Newcastle University Business School. Um, I am joined by my colleague, Kirsty, who is just going to be in the background. Um, Kirsty, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Kirsty. I'm the International Student Recruitment Manager. I'm also here to help with any questions that you might have. But Ruta, you, you're in safe hands with Ruta. Well, thanks, Kirsty. So you'll see that we also have um, some of our business ambassadors on the call. Um, so we have Alice and Nice, um, who are here really just to share their experiences and answer any questions that you have. But we will first have a brief presentation. Um, and if you think of any question, questions as we're presenting, please just pop them in the chat below and we'll pick them up after the presentation. OK, so I'll try to change the slide there. It's probably loading ever so slightly, uh, ever so slowly. But what we were going to ask everyone is just um, to change your Zoom username if you can. Um, so if you could just change that to your actual name, it'll help us take a register. Okay. So to start with, um, let's see what accommodation options you have as postgraduate students here. <clears throat> so you may cho choose to go with university owned accommodation. So this just means renting a room or a whole flat through the university. This is probably the most popular option among students. Some students instead choose to live in managed partnership accommodation. So this is accommodation that's owned by private providers, but run in partnership with the university. And your final option is really just going through a private accommodation provider. So whether it's you know, a specific student accommodation provider, a landlord or an agency, um, there's quite a few different options there. Um, so this is probably the least a popular option among postgraduate students as it requires a little bit more effort on your part to really just find something suitable. And it's obviously also a little bit more risky as you're going through unfamiliar processes all by yourself. Okay, um, I'll get on to the next slide. And first of all, we'll talk about uh, university owned accommodation. Kirsty, could you get onto the next slide for me? I'm not sure if it's just taken a while loading. Okay, here we go. Um, so first of all, why, why would you choose to live in university owned accommodation? So if you submit your application by the 31st of July, you are covered by what we call the new student guarantee. So this just means that all new students are guaranteed to be offered a room if they apply for accommodation by the end of July. So this really takes the stress out of um, you know, finding somewhere to live by yourself. Um, secondly, we know that postgraduate students come from different backgrounds and, you know, they seek different things in their accommodation and the university really does provide a good variety of room options in different types of buildings for you. Our accommodation has also placed us in the top 20 of the What Uni Student Choice Awards in 2020, so you know it's well loved by students. Um, just as importantly, our accommodation isn't just great, it's also really affordable. So you'll see that in 2020, again, we placed eighth in the QS Best Student Cities ranking. And finally, if you choose university accommodation, your rent will include Wi-Fi, utility bills, and even personal possessions insurance. So again, this just makes um, your renting experience that much easier and stress-free. Okay, so next let's look at what options you have as far as university owned accommodation. Um, so there are five options for postgraduate students and we'll look into them a little bit more closely in just a, a second. Um, but what you need to know is that all university halls are directly on campus with the exception of Bowson Court, which is two miles away. All uni halls are self-catered, meaning that there's a communal kitchen for you to use to prepare your food in. Um, and what's new for this year from, from September 2022 onward is that 
you do have the option to add a meal package to your accommodation. So that just means you'll be able to have your meals provided to you on campus via the various outlets that we have. Okay. Um, so I've arranged these five options available to you um, in terms of price. So we'll start with kind of the most affordable option and we'll work our way through to, to the most expensive one. So Jasmine Road um, offers a number of converted townhouses. They're located right next to our Philip Robinson Library uh, and just a six minute walk from uh, the center of campus. So there are three single room options available. So standard or large rooms without a wash basin or rooms that do have a wash basin. Flat sizes are between three and seven students per flat with on average four people sharing one bathroom. And you'll see on the next slide, just some pictures of the accommodation itself. Okay, uh, next we have Bowson Court. So as I mentioned earlier, Bowson Court is the only site that's not located directly on campus, um, but it does sit in the lovely area of South Gosford and it is just a seven minute Metro right away from campus. Um, so with Bowson Court, you would have four options, um, large standard rooms, ensuite rooms, or two or three bedroom flats that are available only for couples or families. Um, so 40 and 50 week contracts are available. Um, the 40 week contract would basically cover your entire time at university, including exams and everything. The 50 week contract would go into the summer a little bit more. So if you kind of have plans to hang around uh, Newcastle after you're through with your exams and things, the 50 week contract would, would cover you for that. Okay, and again, uh, just some pictures of Bowson Court. Next, we have Grand Hotel. So Grand Hotel offers ensuite accommodation right on campus, and it is situated above the university bookshop and a cafe as well, which is really convenient. There are um, two room options available. Um, so ensuite and deluxe ensuite rooms are what you'll be offered. Um, rooms in Grand Hotel aren't uh, located in flats, as is quite typical, but rather on corridors ac across three floors with around two, three kitchens and lounges per one floor. So on average, you'll have around six to 10 people sharing one kitchen and, and one lounge area. Um, Grand Hotel is only available for postgraduate students as well, I should mention. Okay, and next we have Kensington Terrace. So Kensington Terrace um, are around 10 beautifully converted townhouses that overlook Exhibition Park, and it's located right in the heart of campus. Now, postgraduate students can only apply for a double studio flat type in Kensington Terrace, and this is offered uh, on a 50 week contract. And you'll see on the next slide when it gets to it, um, just some lovely pictures of Kensington Terrace there. Okay, and finally, Carlton Lodge. Um, so again, it's located right on campus next to the 24 hour library. Um, with Carlton Lodge, you have two ensuite room options available. So there's deluxe ensuite and superior ensuite. Rooms are spread across four floors with up to six students sharing um, a communal kitchen and lounge area. And all rooms have a super king size bed and TV, which is great for those seeking a little bit of luxury. However, of course, that comes at a certain cost. Um, and you'll see finally some pictures of Carlton Lodge. Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, it is really nicely done out. Um, Okay, so just to show you where all of these different um, accommodation sites are on campus, you'll see, first of all, Jasmine Road right next to the library, as I mentioned. Um, Bowson Court, when my little arrow comes up, um, is not on campus, as mentioned, but it is only a seven minute metro right away. Uh, then Grand Hotel is about as central as it gets. As you can see, you're right on the edge of the city center and right on campus as well. Um, Kensington Terrace, again, right in the heart of campus, really close by to Exhibition Park. 
And finally, Carton Lodge is right next to Jasmine Road, uh, and again, right next to, to our library. So all of the accommodation sites are really, really conveniently located um, right on campus and right next to the city center. Okay, so if you're interested in applying for university-owned accommodation um, and haven't applied yet, this is just a quick overview of what the process would look like. Um, so first, because applications for university accommodation are already open, you would just receive an email from the accommodation team soon after you receive your offer from us. You would then have to apply online via the application portal. Um, you would need to create a profile on the application portal, so the number you'll need for this will be sent to you in, in the email from our accommodation team. Um, if you're applying as a single student, you would be allowed to put down three choices in order of preference. And I believe it's two choices if you're applying as a family or a couple. And once you've applied, um, as long as you submitted your application before the end of July, you are guaranteed to receive an accommodation offer from us. And you can expect to hear by around mid-August if you choose to your uh, and if you choose to accept your accommodation offer, something to know is that you would not need to pay a deposit. Okay. So with managed partnership accommodation, I'm not going to go into lots of detail here, um, but something to know is that it's a type of accommodation that's run by private providers, but in partnership with the university. Um, you can see the three partnerships that the university has for the next academic year, if you wish to explore them. Um, the main thing really you need to know is that very often with um, managed partnership accommodation, you would be asked to provide a guarantor. A uh, guarantor is someone who um, lives in the UK with a UK address, is over 25 um, and in employment. So this is someone who would essentially pick up your rent should you not be able to, to pay your rent anymore. Now, for international students, obviously, unless you have family or friends here in the country already, finding a guarantor can be a bit tricky. So the only way to, to kind of go around this would be to pay your whole rent um, for the duration of your contract upfront um, and in full. Okay, and the last type of accommodation to look into is private. So as far as private accommodation, this would be either a room or a whole flat that you would rent through an agency or a landlord. Um, students really tend to live in areas close to campus with the closest one and most popular destination being Jasmine, um, also Sandyford and Heaton. Prices will very much depend on the area that you're in, with Jasmine and Sandiford pro probably being just slightly more expensive and, and Heathen probably being a little bit more affordable. Um, and, you know, why do some students choose to, to rent their accommodation privately? There's a few reasons, really. You know, you might be slightly older than the average master's students and therefore want a little bit more privacy and independence. Um, you may just want to meet people outside of university so you can expand and, and diversify your circle, circle of friends. Um, but there are, of course, um, disadvantages to renting privately as well. Um, so it can feel a little isolating, especially if you're renting a studio and, and live alone. Um, and the big one as well is that if you're renting privately, then you don't have the security of being protected by the university. Uh, and therefore, if something goes wrong, it'll be up to you to kind of deal with, with the agency or, or your landlord. Okay, but if you are going the private route, I would highly advise that you explore the advice and guidance available uh, via our students' union. So they have lots of useful information on the website, such as what to look out for in your accommodation contract, what agencies to avoid, how to search for accommodation, and much, much more. Um, so Kirsty might be able to just drop these two links in, in the chat for you so you can open them and save them for later if you wish to explore them. Okay. Okay, so next, let's quickly look at some of Newcastle's top, top sites. Uh, so first up, we have the business school on the left, which is where you'll be based for the majority of your lectures. Uh, the business school is very conveniently located close to both the city center and the main campus, and it's also part of the Newcastle Helix site, as you can see on the top right picture. Helix is 
uh, where business meets science, we often say. So it's, it's home to the university's National Innovation Centers for Data and Aging. Uh, it brings academia, the public sector, uh, business and industry together. Uh, as well on, on the top uh, right is St. James' Stadium. So if any of you are into football, you'll be happy to know that St. James' Stadium sits right outside of the business school. Um, and we do get discounted tickets through our students' union for students to, to enjoy a match or two. Okay, so next is um, the key side and all of Newcastle's bridges. Uh, so the key side stretches out along the River Tyne and it's packed with, with nightlife and kind of stylish bars and restaurants and places for you to hang out in. On Sundays, uh, we have something on called the Keyside Market. It's just a, a market which kind of sells local produce, crafts, um, and street food. Um, and you'll notice as well quite a few bridges in these pictures. So you may be surprised to know that um, seven main bridges go across the River Tyne, and really they're, they're quite an iconic symbol of Newcastle. Next, we have um, Gray Street and the monument. So Gray Street is renowned for its Georgian architecture. In 2010, it was voted best street in the UK by BBC Radio 4. Um, Gray Street is just another one of those streets that's packed full of restaurants, bars, there's a cinema, uh, and it also leads uh, towards the monument, which you can see in the top right picture, sorry, top left picture. Okay, on Gray Street, you'll also find um, the Theatre Royal. So you can see it in the pictures there. Um, it's a building that's only one of nine grade one listed theatres in England. Uh, it's a neoclassical monument and Newcastle's culture engine. Um, so it, it hosts around uh, 400 performances each year. Um, so again, something to look into if you're not kind of big on the nightlife side of things. Okay, and when we get onto the next slide, um, you'll see our Granger Market and kind of the beginning of Chinatown there. So Granger Market is a, a large indoor market known, known as Newcastle's first supermarket, and it's, it's well loved by students and locals alike. Um, it's got lots of kind of small traders and, and local businesses, you know, so you'll find everything from florists to jewelers to bakers to butchers to greengrocers in there. If you're a foodie as well, um, you will enjoy the variety of food offered at the Granger Market. So, you know, you can grab yourself a, a fresh slice of pizza, Greek food, Asian food, handmade cakes, and, and really just so much more. Um, as well, on the right, uh, you'll have seen the entrance to Chinatown. Um, so actually it's located very close to the business school and it's something probably you'll pass on your way to the business school every morning. Um, so next we have a few pictures from, um, from uh, the local parks in Newcastle. So starting at the top left um, is Alnwy Castle. Um, so you might've heard of Harry Potter and the Hogwarts castle, which was based on our own only castle. Um, you can even apparently go for broomstick flying lessons there. So that's something you might choose to do when you're here with us in September. Um, on the bottom left, we've got Jasmine Dean, which is a really beautiful and big park that students like to go to. Um, on the top right, we've got Adrian's Wall. Um, so Adrian's Wall is a place where you can walk from east to the west across the country, if you fancy that. Um, it's nearly 2,000 years old, and it was built by the Romans to keep the Scots out. Uh, and finally, on the bottom uh, right, it's the statue of Angel of the North, which is, again, something quite iconic to Newcastle and something you may well pass um, when you come see us here in September. So next, there's just a few pictures of the coast. Um, so if you guys had a look at the map, you'll know that Newcastle has a really beautiful coastline uh, and we are quite conveniently located um, next to the seaside. So uh, some of UK's finest beaches and kind of dramatic coastal scenery you'll be able to find here. 
and seaside towns like Tynemouth, Whitley Bay uh, are, are linked by a number of metro stations, so it's quite easy to get there from the city centre. Uh, lots of students like to enjoy a nice day out at the beach when we get some warmer weather here. Uh, and you know, you may well find yourself having some fish and chips, uh, or maybe just getting into water and experiencing surfing or paddle boarding, kayaking, um, and exploring lots of the ruins that are dotted along the coast as well. And last but not least, perhaps not the most exciting place in Newcastle, but a very important one to you guys. Uh, so this is our international airport. It's the largest airport in the Northeast. However, when you visit, you will realize that it actually it is quite compact and really well connected to the city. So again, all you have to do is just jump on the Metro 20 minutes and you're at the airport. Uh, and you may well find yourself using this airport when you're here with us, uh, just to get away for a short weekend in Europe, as it is really, really well connected with Europe. Okay, so next we'll, we'll just try to play a video, a very quick video to you that just really captures the beauty of our campus and our city. So hopefully that's given everyone a taste of what awaits you here when you join us in September. And now we'll just move on to the Q&A part of this webinar. So to start, I will ask our business ambassadors to just introduce themselves uh, and maybe mention the program that they're studying. So um, Alice, can I start with you first? Oh, I forgot to unmute, sorry. <laughs> That's fine, were you on mute there? That's okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Alice, I'm studying international business management. Brilliant, thank you, Alice. And Nice? Hi, my name is Nice. I'm studying MSc International Marketing. Brilliant, thank you, Nice. And I don't know if we have Runa on the call. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Hi, Runa. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Runa and I'm from the uh, MBA cohort for this year. Again, thanks Runa. Um, so yeah, so we've got three of our business ambassadors. Um, if you do have any questions, and I'll just quickly check my chat box. Um, we do, okay. So we'll start with your questions and then we'll move on to some of my questions that I have. Um, so, the first question is, um, the admissions office told me that I will get feedback regarding the accommodation application in August, but they did not tell me about this new student guarantee, so I don't have to worry at all. Um, yes, so since you've applied before um, the 31st of July deadline, you are guaranteed to receive an offer from us um, for your accommodation. Uh, like I said, they, it's not um, based uh, on a first come first serve basis at all. So as long as you apply by the end of July, you will receive an offer for one of the choices that you've put down on your application. Uh, so really at this point, all you have to do is, is just wait for accommodation to, uh, to sort out through all of the applications. And as they mentioned to you, it'll be sometime in August that they will let you know uh, exactly where you'll be staying. Uh, thank you for your answer. That was uh, really helpful. And can I add a further question? I got a, uh, I, I got an answer from uh, from your colleague, uh, uh, Miss Seth Clark. Uh, hopefully, I did, uh, I pronounced the name uh, correctly. But uh, mm -hmm. she she couldn't tell me. Uh, uh, is uh, do you have an information how long I have to accept the offer? Let's say. I Hi, Sihan. So what I told you was um, when you get your offer from the accommodation office, yeah. they will tell you in that email how long you have to, to respond. Yeah, but you can't tell me. No, in no, 
No, unfortunately not. It's um, it, this is more of a general sort of information piece, but it would usually be around a couple of weeks, maybe up to a month. But I couldn't give you any any specific dates. Okay, that's great. But they they will definitely advise you, um, on how long it is that you have to accept that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, I think someone might have their hand raised. So whoever you are, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, that'll be me. Uh, my name is Kenny. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Could you speak just ever so slightly louder, Kenny? I'm just, it's, I can hear you, but it's very quiet. Oh, okay. Can you, what about now? Uh, a bit better. Better. <laughs> okay. Sorry, it's so early here. I don't want to wake everybody. So, uh, but my question is, um, if I would appreciate if you, if you could probably send, are we going to get this, this slide that you used this morning? Um, so we weren't going to share the slides, but we were going to upload just this whole webinar on YouTube and then probably share the link with you afterwards. Oh, great. I think yeah. that will work. So what I actually need is, because I've been talking to some private, uh, I didn't realize, I mean, probably it's my fault. I didn't read the emails. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> my, my fault. But so I realized now that it's easier going through the school, even if I want a private um, accommodation. So. Mm -hmm. But I didn't write down the names of those ones you, you mentioned. I just want to, you know, explore. So probably I'll wait for the video to, to land on YouTube and I'll go through it. Yeah, I mean, I can maybe ask Kirsty to just type this out in the chat for you now. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming you're asking about the three providers that we have, that the university has partnerships with for like next yeah. academic year. Yeah, so it was um, Newgate Court, um, Portland Green, and Wellington same plaza. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think someone's um, already. Yeah. Kirsty is already yeah. actually tabulated. it. Thank you. Yeah. And the five in the chat just now. So this is the university owned accommodation. Okay. Yeah. Where you just need to apply by the end of July. If you know, if that's what you want to go for and you're guaranteed to, to receive an offer from them. Right. Um, one thing I will say, if you somehow miss the 31st of July uh, deadline, you could still apply for accommodation with us. Uh, there just kind of wouldn't be a guarantee that you will get one of the three options that you put down on your application form. Mm -hmm. But it's very likely that the university would still offer you something. It's just likely to be with one of the kind of private providers rather than something that the university owns, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, so not sure if I missed any questions in the chat there at all, uh, but Kirsty can let me know if I have. Um, yeah, please pop your questions uh, in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak to us on camera as well. That's absolutely fine. But in the meantime, whilst we're waiting for more questions, um, I'm just going to ask our ambassadors to let you guys know um, where where they cho chose to stay this academic year. So um, Runa, I'll start with you. Could you tell us what type of accommodation you're staying in throughout your master's studies? And, and do you enjoy it? And you know, why or why not? Okay, Bruna might have disconnected by accident possibly. So nice, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, what accommodation are you staying in? Okay, so mine was living, which is called as The View. This is actually in the past year as a managed partnership with the university. But this year I, I heard that it's not there anymore. But yeah, mine was choosing The View because it's close to the, the business school. It's just like, you know, two minute walk there. And it's pretty close. It's very convenient. Yeah, that's what I should say. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and Alice, what accommodation are you staying in? Um, I'm staying at Newcastle one. It, um, it's not so far from business school, but um, a little bit farther than the room. Okay, brilliant. Um, hey, Ruta, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, Runa, I can hear you now. Yes, hi. Ah, okay. I, I think there was a problem with my internet or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Sorry, fine. I, I heard you ask me the question and then I was talking and then <laughs> I don't know what happened. Don't worry. It happens. That's totally fine. So, so yeah. So where, where are you staying at the moment, Runa? So I am uh, staying at the university accommodation at Boston Court. 
uh, and uh, even though it's not on the campus and it's it's like a metro right away like you explained earlier uh, but what I really like about this accommodation is the area the South Cosford area is actually pretty nice and uh, because of how calm and how uh, you know fresh it feels uh, I don't really mind taking that seven to ten minute metro ride to the school because um, even though the city center is like really bustling and uh, a lot of people around but if uh, if somebody really wants to be a part of, uh, of a place which is quieter and mm -hmm. uh, Bowson Court is really really nice and it's nice and lovely and fresh um, mm -hmm. yeah brilliant awesome um, and Veruna, just whilst you're on, could you tell me kind of what influenced your decision to, to go with, you know, the type of accommodation that you went with? Um, what kind of factors did you look into? Uh, well, I was obviously very keen on having the accommodation through the university. I did not uh, consider looking outside for private accommodation. And that was a personal bias uh, mm -hmm. because... I felt it was more convenient mm -hmm. and I had a uh, given couple of choices like I think we can choose two or three options mm -hmm. and then they do a matchmaking and see what, whatever is available mm -hmm. so my uh, criteria was I need an ensuite so I wanted mm -hmm. an ensuite and I uh, wanted it to be a university accommodation so to be very honest my first choice was uh, Grand Hotel and second was Boston and third was Jesmond. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad that uh, I was uh, given Boston Court. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, probably I wouldn't have been uh, as happy as I am here as I would be in Grand Hotel. I My first choice of Grand Hotel was because it's so close to the university, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have enjoyed what I enjoy here. Mm -hmm. So yes, first of all, it was... Uh, the university accommodation and second of all it was uh, sorry what did I say sorry I'm I'm a little jet <laughs> lagged <laughs> that's fine Runa don't worry um yeah I mean it, it's great that you got into your second option obviously yeah. as I mentioned it's not always that students will get whatever they put down as their you know absolute preference but hopefully out of the three choices, you know, whatever you get, you'll kind of be happy with. Um, and I think that the standard of the accommodation that we have at Newcastle is really quite good. Uh, you know, they've been um, renovating lots of the buildings, building new buildings over the last couple of years. So I think you're, if you choose to go with, with university-owned accommodation, I think you will find yourself quite happy. And also it's very secure. We have periodic uh, security checks and uh, you have a, proper kitchen and a common room and everything is set well and uh, you don't really have to worry about the security factor at all I'm because I haven't stayed in a private accommodation I don't know whether that's a problem or not but mm -hmm. uh, definitely in uh, Boston Court uh, because it's for a PG it is a PG accommodation we don't have UG students here all mm -hmm. of us are, are either PG or PhDs mm -hmm. So uh, we have that kind of uh, environment around, which is similar to what I would like to have, given you know, that I'm a PG student. And, and obviously, there's a difference. So that, that really worked out well for me. Brilliant. Excellent. Thanks, Rina. Um, so I do have a question in the chat. Um, so the student says, I have quite a general question. Why did the current students decide to come to Newcastle and are they satisfied with their choice? Um, so nice, I'll, I'll put this to you first of all. Yeah, sure. So actually Newcastle University is my first choice ever because when I searched for, you know, marketing field of study, Newcastle was come up on the top list and you know all the academic lectures were very very specialized in marketing that is why I, I choose Newcastle because of this as well secondly it's because of like the city Newcastle is very really convenient it's like you know a compact city of London you can find everything's here in Newcastle mm -hmm. and you know as um Ruda said about like you know the place attractions around here you can go just like 10 minute 20 minute to the beach it's really convenient sometimes you might feel like stressful 
and then you can just like hop into the metro and go to the beach. It's very convenient, mm-hmm. and you know, student here is very you know multicultural students. You can find all international students from around the world here in the castle, so it's very you know a good place to stay. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. I think especially at the business school, there's a really strong multicultural student community going. Obviously, that applies to the rest of the university, but it's definitely definitely true for the business school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Thanks, Nice. And um, Alice, the same question to you. Why did you choose to come to Newcastle and are you satisfied with that choice? Um, I chose to come to Newcastle because um, first it's the living cost. It's not as expensive as um, London. Actually, my dad kind of prefer London, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I want to save some costs. So I chose Newcastle and also about um, the food. I heard there are only few cities that have Chinatown mm-hmm. in UK. Yeah, and I and I'm not good with cooking, so I, <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, I can buy some Asian food in Chinatown, and also um, pretty much the same as Nice because I love the beach as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's I think it's the perfect location and low living cost. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is super duper affordable, especially when you compare it to some of the universities, you know, down south London, like you mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, we are really well connected to the rest of the UK, I think. And, you know, especially nowadays, there's a train that only takes two and a half hours and you're in London. Yes. Um, so if you do fancy kind of visiting the capital for the weekend, it's, it's kind of easy enough to do, I think. Yes. Um, and Runa, I'll, I'll come to you again with the same question. So what influenced your decision to come to Newcastle? Oh, you're on mute, Runa. There you go. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first of all, when I was doing my research on uh, which university to choose, uh, obviously, I was checking, you know, some of the accreditations and the ratings and uh, stuff like that. And uh, the MBA for the Newcastle Business University Business School uh, is well accredited. We have three accreditations for our MBA mm-hmm. and uh, we, we are consistently ranked within the top 150 uh, on the QS. So that was definitely one of my... Um, and these are uh, the numbers that I'm, you know, the talking about are from previous year, and they have definitely improved this year. And uh, in addition to that, uh, it is one of the Russell Group universities, which is quite prestigious in itself. So these these were some of the factors that I considered. And then in my initial days, when I was in touch with the uh, with the university and trying to get help. Uh, the, the staff was very helpful and mm-hmm. I got all these information that I was looking for. Uh, also, uh, I was lucky enough or fortunate enough to be a part of the scholarship scheme. Uh, and that was really, uh, you know, it was very attractive for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm glad that I made that decision. And apart from that, the city, yes, it's a student city because we have two universities in this city and it's very student friendly and like uh, nice said uh, it is uh, you know it's uh, it's very close to the beach it is actually quite beautiful when I arrived uh, it was winter and from where I come from India it's it's the winter is not this harsh but then <laughs> it, you get used to it and the summer is actually quite lovely it's a lovely day today. It's nice and bright and sunny. So uh, my favorite place is the Jasmine Dean, to be very honest, and the uh, Annick Castle. I've been to those two places. And I love the beach also, but uh, Jasmine Dean and Annick was, are my favorite. So it's, and, uh, it's not as expensive and as uh, rushed as London, because in India, I did live in you know, huge cities mm-hmm. where the life is really fast. But in Newcastle, I think it's uh, really, um, you know, it, the, the MBA is going to be stressful, but the city life itself is not. So yeah. it's quite easy to go around. It's well connected. The metro, the bus, uh, everything uh, is, is just something that's very convenient. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, yeah, I would say we do have quite good public transport here in Newcastle. Um, maybe it doesn't apply for the metro because the metro does tend to run a little bit late sometimes. Um, but as everyone mentioned just now, you know, we are a really compact city. And if you live kind of close by campus, you'll probably just find yourself um, walking for the most part. Students love to use bikes as well. There's lots of bike storage around the university. Uh, so that's an option too. Um, and there was a question in the chat that Kirsty's already answered, but just in case people haven't picked up on this, um, Rose asked, is the number of female um, is the number of females in the business school much greater than males? Um, and actually, as Kirsty mentioned, it, it's not. We do we are quite lucky to have a, a rough 50-50 split between male and female students. Um, okay. So I'm, this is another question from Sihan. So um, as Runa mentioned, Russell Group, I am from Germany. That's why I can evaluate if the brand Russell Group is helpful when applying for a job in consulting or M&A. Is it possible to give me advice here? Would the brand Russell Group will be helpful? Because as far as I know, it just means the universities are quite strong in research. It's a good question, Sihan. Um, who could I direct this to? Runa, would you kind of be able to speak a bit more on, you know, what it means to be part of the Russell Group? Uh, well, uh, I have not, I cannot answer that question with a lot of clarity because I still am in the process of applying for jobs mm -hmm. and uh, it is not something that I have had the time to explore so far. So whether it's something that is helpful in terms of job application, uh, right now is something that I cannot answer. Maybe a couple of months down the line when I'm actively uh, doing the application. And if I put that in my CV, probably I will find out mm -hmm. more about it. But honestly, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer that, but you're right. It is a brand which is which means it's quite strong in research, and I think what will be helpful is if you are planning to continue your work in the field of research or in the field you you take it to a PhD level. I think it is going to be definitely helpful. But in terms of a job in the market, I'm yet to find that out. And uh, I, if I answer that question right away, I won't be doing justice. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to come in here. Um, I think it's um, it's an interesting one if you don't come from the UK and you don't understand the concept of the of the Russell Group brand. And there's 24 um, universities in the Russell Group itself. Um, and you're looking at places like Manchester, Oxford, um, Queen's University, Belfast, um, Bristol, Cambridge, places like that. So all very highly ranked um, universities, which are what world renowned. Um, and I think one of the things that it attracts, it's not just the students that it attracts. Um, it's the it's the world leading industries and businesses that we get to work with because of the brand behind us. Um, and whilst it might seem a little bit sort of unusual to talk about how research can impact on students, um, it's not necessarily about you wanting to take your research further and become a researcher per se. It's about how the, um, you know, our academics who are world leading in their fields, you know, we, we attract those academics who want to work for a research intensive university so it's the research that they do that then directly impacts on you as a student because it's the most up-to-date it's often impactful on um, everything from our local to our national to our global economies um, you know society in general the amount that we inject actually into into the economy is around 87 billion pounds per year with with the research that we do um and you know it's that having that on your um you know on your academic resume um is something that in some markets will really count and in other places they might just look that you've got a master's so it, you know, in 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 all honesty, it, it will depend on on where you're looking to apply. Um, but there are some markets where they will literally consider the university that you've um, that you've studied at. You can sort of compare it a little bit to um, to the American Ivy League 
standard universities, that's the sort of the easiest comparison. Um, but yeah, from a brand perspective, it, it, it can go far. So it's like a visa versa, like you, you attract the most, uh, the best uh, researchers and they, yeah. they do the and best. And it filters practice. down. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. it filters yeah. down. And, and if, you know, for those students who maybe want to get more of an in-depth sort of like deep dive, say, into their, um, into their field. I know, for example, we've got a, um, one of our global human resource management students is actually, um, he's taken on work as a research assistant um, within our human resources um, uh, research community. Um, so he's getting a, a, a lot of experience um, and he doesn't want to do a PhD, but he wants to be able to show that he's got that experience, has really done that deep dive into the um, into the subject that he cares passionately about. He does come from a um, six years in, in work already before coming to do his math masters um and so he's then able to take part in this um in this research in his field which he can then take out into the world of work so it's kind of a trickle down um effect but you know like attracts like so we get the you know the amazing academics we get the um you know the world leading businesses who want to invest in us and our research that will then you know um infer on on what happens globally and and Locally, importantly for us. Thank you. That, that was really helpful. <laughs> good. Hey, thanks for your question, Sihan. It's a really good question. Um, so we got another question from Rose in the chat. Uh, Rose said, can I change my course after I enter Newcastle? Um, Kirsty, you might have to correct me here, but I don't believe that that's an option with masters. It's, it's a bit of a difficult one because um, it really depends. Our, our entry requirements tend to be fairly uh, standard across the board. You certainly couldn't go from, say, um, a master's into an MBA, for example, um, because that has got very different entry requirements. But if you were wanting to go from um, uh, international business management into marketing, it may be possible that you could do that, but it would have to be a very, very quick decision um, because a, a year long master's program is a very intensive uh, is a very intensive uh, academic year. And so you basically you hit the ground running from the get go. And if you miss more than a week, maybe two of, of your initial uh, teaching time, then you really are set on the back foot. So that would have to be a discussion with the program, the, the degree program director um, from whichever program you want to go to and the degree program director from the program you are coming from. Um, but you would have to have a good reason as to why you really didn't want to continue on your program. It's why we do sort of give you the opportunity, you know, if you're not sure about what you want to study, take the opportunity um, to come and talk to someone like myself, like Ruta. Um, if we can get you in front of a student who's doing the program that you're interested in, you can ask them questions. You know, if you've got questions that we can put to an academic, we can re relay their responses back to you. Um, but, you know, we're here to help you make uh, the, the right decision the first time if we can um, so I'm going to finish by saying it's not a definite no but it's possibly not okay thanks Christy um, Rose hopefully that's answered it for you but but please do put another question in the chat if you've got anything else um, we've got about 10 minutes left of this webinar guys so do get your questions in if you've got any questions whilst our ambassadors are still here um, in the meantime, I just wanted to ask um, Alice, I'll start with you. How do you find the locals in Newcastle, Alice? And what do you make of the Geordie accent? Um, I think it's, it's um, I would say it's unique. Mm -hmm. um, people here are very nice, but um, in terms of Geordie accent, it's um, a little hard for me to understand sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but people are very nice. It's like um, they talk to you and they welcome you, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we, we do have such a large student population in Newcastle that I think mm -hmm. whether the locals like it or not, they've had to, you know, come to like students. So I would say definitely in my experience, everyone gets along really, really well. Um, the students like the locals and the locals like the students um, as yeah. well. Is, is that your experience too nice? What would you say? Yeah, 
They are super nice. Actually, especially I went to, you know, the Cringe Market. Mm-hmm. They're all local people just selling things there. And I went there. They're all really nice, like all helpful mm-hmm. things. And especially for Newcastle University, they also have like um, online classes for Jodi as well. Jodi language in the really? very beginning. And I just yeah. joined that class and I just learned some, you know, vocabulary, sentence. And it's quite amazing accents. I mean, it's nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, how interesting. I had absolutely no idea that, that we do this. Is this something done through the students' union or? Yeah, student unions, like in the very beginnings of the terms. Yeah. Yeah. So quite a few of you that choose to come here um, in September, you might want to take take up those classes or, you know, just go rogue and just socialize with as many joys as you possibly can. Um, and, and yeah, then you learn that way. Um, Kirsty, could you just check? I think someone's in the waiting room. Um, I kind of, for the life of me, go onto that screen now to accept people. Let me see if um, I can find that. Thank you. Um, okay, so Rose asked another question. Uh, what job opportunity is there in Newcastle for part-time jobs? Um, so I can definitely help with that, but I don't know if you, Alice, Runa, or Nice have any experience with this, with like part-time work alongside your studies? No, not, not for me, because uh, as you would know that the MBA is very, very intense and uh, I just did not think that I would have the time to you know, manage both because I didn't want to compromise on my main goal here, which was to focus on the degree. So I, I did not go into that uh, line of finding a part-time job. Of course, yeah, no, totally understand. Yeah. Um, Alice or Nice, have you guys had any experience with part-time work? Um, I, I haven't had any part-time work yet, but a lot of my friends have part-time job. Um, I think we can work up to 20 hours a week if you have student visa, I think. And I think they all have um pretty good time working part-time job. There are lots of that's wrong that will accept you, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like Alice said, I would say finding part-time work here in Newcastle is fairly easy. Um, so if you want to work just in the city, um, like Alice mentioned, in a cafe or a restaurant or a hotel, something along those lines, there's plenty available. And I would say then it might be good for you to come a little bit earlier before the year starts, because usually in September, there's a big rush of obviously students moving into Newcastle uh, and people do tend to look for jobs to, to help them support themselves throughout their studies. Uh, so some of those part-time roles might kind of go by the end of September if you only arrive by late. But as well, um, there's plenty available through the university itself. Um, so we do have an award-winning career service, which really, really supports um, students of all uh, stages and all courses. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could just log on to our big jobs board. Um, where we post various vacancies that aren't just, um, you know, kind of hospitality or admin roles. Um, there's, there's teaching roles, there's research roles available. Um, there's also a scheme in Newcastle called JobSoc, which is a temps pool. So um, they kind of offer casual work opportunities around campus. Uh, so there's no hours guaranteed, but likewise, you're not having to commit to anything. It's just um, they will email you when there's work available and you can choose whether to accept it or not. Uh, and you like like the students mentioned, you have to make sure that you work no more than 20 hours because that's what's likely going to be on your visa conditions. And actually, that just applies to all students. Um, you do have to work up to 20 hours per week during term time, during holiday periods. Uh, so times like Christmas and Easter or the summer holidays, you are um, allowed to work a bit more. OK, Rose, hopefully that's answered that for you. Um, Sihan has asked, does the university work together with banks from the city and the big consulting companies like McKinsey, BSG? Um, Kirsty is nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. Yes, um, they do. It's something that we're actually really proud of. Um, and I actually, I was asked this question um, not so long ago from, from someone else. And so I reached out to someone in our uh, careers team for graduate destinations to show sort of like where our alumni are going as well. Um, and um, so I can actually tell you, so um, 
graduates working at a director level, um, including uh, VP at some of these companies, we've got um, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Barclays, um, Morgan Stanley, Bloomberg. Um, and, you know, we have these people who are aligned to our own LinkedIn channels. So they're, they're people that we can reach out to um, as individuals when we um, perhaps want to search for internships, um, student placements for our undergrads students um but it's obviously people that are available in, in the alumni community as well that you know we we would stress for new alumni to be able to reach out to um but when it comes to actually working with these big companies um we have a corporate engagement team um who spend all of their time and um, just networking and a relationship building um with people from from industries that we know will benefit the students um it, it might sound a little bit crass to say it but um if you get a job it's a win-win situation because you get a job and we look good and um, because we've probably helped you uh you know be able to do that whether it's the the links that you've taken with our career service to help you know sort of boost your social media um you know um, profile you know how to look on on social media how to how to really work your linkedin um how to write a, a global resume um you know assessment centers so uh, you know every all the opportunities that we can help you with if you take advantage of them then it puts you in a good position that we can then put you in front of these big businesses and say look <laughs> look at these amazing sort of graduates that we've got um and so we are often targeted by these um by these global companies who actually want to come and meet our graduates we hold employability fairs i mean ruta can talk a lot about this she's the expert in the room about um internships and, and links with employers um so actually you know if you want to talk a bit more about that out, outside of this space then you know we'll, i think we're going to be doing a session on it in either july or august i can't remember what the dates we got but we will be advertising those um but if you want to talk to the careers, someone in the careers team as well, um, about what your opportunities might be to to get in front of these big businesses, then I'm I'm happy to um I'm gonna put our email address in the chat box now. Um but if you want to drop us an email, I'm happy to arrange for you to have a, a, a Zoom call with one of our careers team so you can see, you know, where it is that we can help you. So if you bear with me, I'll just pop our our address into the into the chat box there. Thank you so much. Uh, also, I can uh, add a little bit on that, uh, Christy, if, if that's okay with you. Yes, please. So, <laughs> yeah, so for, uh, I'm not aware of the other master uh, courses, but for the MBA, we work very closely with life on life projects from many of the companies and the the co course has something called the business in action, the business in action module, what we do is we actually collaborate with companies like Lloyd's or HSBC if you're looking at banks or we also have companies like NWG and many other startups uh, in and around Northeast and we collaborate with these companies they bring to us their uh, actual real problems and we do work on those real pro problems in the capacity of a consultant. And uh, in our business in action this year, we were supposed to go to London, but during that time, the Omicron was raving, so we could not. But then the university arranged for a visit later, and we also went and worked with PwC. Uh, so yes, the engagement of the university and companies like Lloyd's or a PwC and all the others that uh, Christy just mentioned, uh, we quite closely knit. Uh, in fact, uh, a part of another module, which is the management consultancy project, uh, in that as well, we work with clients, real clients with real business problems. Uh, so that gives us a lot of opportunity to network with these uh, companies that we might target in the future for our own employability. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. Yes, I, it is. I'm looking forward to make my MBA in Newcastle. <laughs> are you are you also applying for MBA or uh, something? No, no, I got I got an offer for the Master in International Business Management. I just have a bachelor degree, but uh, as soon as I uh, have some uh, real job experience, then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but yeah, the uh, it's 
it's quite interesting when you get to work with real companies with their real projects and that's that's when you're doing the work so you have this period the first semester is giving you the essence of the academic and the theory and from the second semester onwards when you get in get you have to get your hands dirty to understand and you know do the things that you've learned this is your opportunity to do yeah, but, but I guess after a project like this to getting an interview shouldn't be that that difficult, right? I'm, I'm yet to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not. But yes. yeah. Oh, all the very best to you, Bruna. I'm sure you'll do fabulously. Thank you. Um, I've just got a question from Claudia in the chat. So Claudia has asked, do most postgraduate students join clubs or societies? What has your experience been like? Um, so nice. Can I put this to you first? Have you joined any any clubs or societies since coming here? Yes, I joined several clubs and society. Actually, in the beginning of a term, you will have like a club flair, which means you have like a lot of clubs gather around and you can go and join several mm -hmm. clubs. So I joined like sport club mostly because I go with my friends. And yeah, there are a lot of society that you can go for. And especially because I'm from Thailand, so we have like a Thai society as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely sure that it would be like for others, you know, countries, mm -hmm. club as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely sure. I am pretty certain that a lot of countries have already got their own societies going that people can join. But likewise, if there's not society that, you know, that you really want to join, you can create a society um, and you'll get funding from the students union to kind of, you know, help you with with your activities as part of that society. So I think that that's really great. Uh, but certainly there's nearly 200 societies for you to join. So I think you'll you'll struggle to kind of come up with another one um, to create. Uh, Alice? Has that been the same to you? Have you joined any societies or clubs? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, exactly the same as night. I joined the Thai society and I also spent a lot of time on sport club. Yeah, because um, in Newcastle, we have a lot of sports, like various kind of sport where you can do with your friends at the gym. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we do have a really beautiful sports center, which has yes. been built not too long ago. Um, it's mm -hmm. absolutely massive. It's on campus. It's very affordable to join and it's got a fantastic gym. So if anyone's into sports, you will be absolutely spoiled um, for choice when you come here. OK, so Claudia, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, next. Yeah, no problem. Uh, next, we've got uh, a question here. Do the courses of master's program of business school have intense schedules? Um, so. I mean, on the whole, I'd probably say yes. Um, if you look at it more closely, it's probably going to depend a little bit on your particular program. Um, obviously, you will not find out what your schedule is until you're here in September and you know your lectures and your seminars are about to start. But if you'd like to get more of an idea, um, you could contact us just at the email address that's kind of below your message. Um, and we'd be able to send you like a um, kind of an example of a, of someone's schedule, someone that's on your program. So it'll be um, kind of a timetable from this year. And obviously it's uh, you know unlikely they'll be the exact same next year, but it can give you an idea of how many contact hours you have during the week. Um, I'm just I'm just gonna go through to see if I can um, find a presentation that I have an example timetable on. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll share my screen very quickly, but it's, it is a very good question. I would say if you consider your master's study as a full-time job, um you know nine till five monday to friday if you're not on a lecture um sort of considering what you might be doing outside of that in for self guided study is what we call it um then it's it's probably the way that you would almost free up your spare time um i'm just going to see if i can show you this um, just very, very briefly, because we are getting other questions, um, but you consider that this is the international business management route of very rightly said um, it might it, it will probably change depending on what program that you are um, you're going to be undertaking. I know um, Runa will probably be laughing because the MBA is particularly uh, intensive and it's it is a little bit more um, sort of hands on on the MBA. Um, but this is this is your average sort of week. 
for a postgraduate course and your your timetable can can vary so you know don't take this as absolutely this is what i'm going to be doing um but these would be your lectures and i think these would be your seminars and workshops um, and then obviously there's any group work that you might do outside of that. You need to take into consideration the research assignment writing that you will be doing. Um, so it is intensive, but you know, it's, you're also here to have fun as well. Absolutely. Um, so I'm just jumping to the next question and hopefully I've not missed anything there. Um, but Sir had us asked, I want to ask about the conditional offer situation. So what are the possibilities to get in if I slightly miss my GPA condition? Um, so it, it really depends on, on your individual case, I would say, Sir Hat. Um, it's, you know, whether you've met all of the other conditions of your offer besides your GPA and then kind of your own personal circumstances. So you know, it might not be a hard miss for you where they would just categorically not um, not uh, change your offer to an unconditional one if you slightly miss your GPA, but it does really depend. And as these de decisions are made by our admissions team, we really kind of wouldn't be able to comment on, on your individual case. Is that right, Kirsty? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, if it does happen that you do miss your GPA slightly, just contact uh, the postgraduate admissions team um, and they'll be able to, to help you out there. Um, okay, question from Kenny. So for MBA, what would you say is the best strategy for success on the program? <laughs> so really, really good question, Kenny. And, and Runa, I'll, I'll put this to you, obviously. That's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, there is actually no one factor or strategy that will make you successful, really. Um, so I got back to studying after decades, after one whole decade. And uh, initially I did struggle, but I think the way the module are structured these days, they are hybrid. So you have, the lecturers have recorded, they have pre-recorded sessions about what they want to talk about, and they upload on this tool called Canvas. And then we also have live seminars inside the classroom. So it's quite hybrid. And what, you know, what we've been told repeatedly uh, is that it's very crucial that we go through those videos and there is going to be a long list of readings. Uh, it's, it's actually important that we go through the videos and do the reading prior coming to class. Because in the class, what we are doing is we are actually not going through the theory dump. We are actually interacting with each other to understand each other's point of view on the theory that we've been taught in the videos. So it is actually reading a lot of reading. I mean, if you're somebody like me who does not read very much at all, I'm I'm being honest here, and uh, it's it was a struggle for me. But then, as and when you uh, get used to the pressure of the assignments, you will learn to read effectively. And there are there are videos that the professors have been so kind and made for us to understand how do we read effectively because you have to read a lot, a lot, and uh, it, there is no end to it. The more you read, the better it is. So how do you then go about reading 10 articles or 15 articles or for example, 20 articles for an assignment? You, you would have to then be very clever in the portions that you choose for that article. And uh, that's the success factor. That's, that's what has helped me progress through, through my MBA because initially, uh, when I did not know the trick, I would read every line and it would take me a lot of time to understand the concept and then finally be able to produce my own work. But later on, when we got to know that there is a trick to do it and you, you have to be very effective in the way you choose what you read, uh, that is what has made a difference because I am reading a lot, but I am not physically reading a lot. So that's that way, you know, you can manage your time. And the second factor, which is most important, uh, I think uh, is going to be your time management because uh, to be very honest, like Christy said, the MBA program is quite intense. 
And it is because we have something every day. We are learning something new every day. And there is a lot of pre-work to be done. And uh, that's why uh, if you are able to manage your time and if you're going to be living alone, you have to do a lot of work around the house as well. You have to do a lot of work for yourself as well. And then you have a lot of work for the university. So how you manage the time is the key. So uh, it's, it's actually not advisable to push your assignments till the end because then obviously the quality of your work will degrade because you're then rushing through the work. So if you're able to manage that time from the very beginning of the week, and then you work throughout the week, I think that's very important. And uh, as a cohort, we've all struggled through this at the very beginning because we are still understanding the process. But by the time we were in the second semester, I think we started to get the hang of it. And we all progressed through the process of you know, time management and how to read effectively. That Those are the two things that I would point out at this moment, yeah. I hope that answered your question. It was a very long answer to a very <laughs> short question. That was a really, really good, thorough answer. I think that gave a lot of insight. So thanks a lot for that, Runa. Um, before we move on to the next question, I'm just going to hand over to Kirsty now. I have to jump on another meeting, but it's really fabulous to see so many of you here on this webinar. Um, and yeah, over to you, Kirsty. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Ruta. <laughs> Bye now. Um, I'm just going to go to the next question from Victor. Um, I would like to appreciate the team at Newcastle University for this webinar. You are more than welcome. Um, I see on the website that the bill for couples accommodation is without utility bills. I would like to know what couples spend on average on utility aside the accommodation fee, and this will enable me to properly plan my finances. Um, Victor, I wasn't aware that bills weren't included in couples accommodation, um, but if they're not, it, it does really depend on what sort of a lifestyle you lead. I'll be quite honest. Um, obviously, if you, I, I would expect Wi-Fi at the very least would be um, would would be there for you. So then you're looking at um, your laundry, um, which you would probably have access to a laundrette within the accommodation, and so that would be at the cost per wash and dry. Um, and I'm not sure what that would be. And then it would be electricity. Um, obviously, around the world you know, rates and bills have gone up somewhat, but because the likelihood is that you're not going to be in your accommodation all of the time, your bills won't actually be that expensive. So from a personal perspective, I know that when we went into lockdown, my bills went up because my, both my partner and myself were working from home. And so we were both using the electricity all day. But now that we're predominantly back in the office, my bills have now gone back to a normal level. Um, and they're actually quite significantly lower than they were before. Um, because, you know, we, we will just work from the office. So it does really depend on on how much, you know, you, you're going to spend time. And I suppose just getting an idea when you move in and then you know, working on it from there as to how you can sort of manage your bills. But I can't really give a very specific response to that, unfortunately. Um, Mav Judah, lovely to see you here. Um, and I can see that, you know, you've got the IELTS test and you might be expected to take your IELTS exam before you come here for the visa. Um, that we do accept other tests other than IELTS. And I don't know whether if it might be worth looking into another test for another test center that might be available. So things like TOEFL or Pearson or Cambridge, um, but that's something that you might wanna have a look into. Um, and stay in touch with Mariam, obviously with the MBA, um, myself and Dave are aware of the of the IELTS situation um, and, and yours. So, you know, stay in touch with us outside of this meeting um, and, and we'll be happy to support you. But it might be worth with the IELTS test centres not necessarily being available um, that you might want to look at another test that we do accept. Um, Rose, are the lessons face to face or online? Um, I'm going to come to Nice and Alice and, and Deb Rooney here. I'll come to Nice first. Um, how have you experienced your your teaching? Because I know that we sort of we did start coming back into the office. Um, so everything that I do is is hybrid. It's either virtual or um, or face to face, but it's mostly face to face for me now. Yeah, so actually right now is everything is face-to-face. -face. Everyone come back to study and class in persons. 
but there's still some class that still hold in online as well. So I would say it's hybrid, but mostly on face-to-face -face one. Alice? Uh, yes, mostly a face to face. Only like a few classes that are online. Mm -hmm. And how do you find the um, you know, the the Canvas situation, um, where the academics sort of upload all the work? Is that easy to use? Um, I can I can take that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you can go ahead, Alice. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can go first. Okay. So yeah, the canvas is actually a brilliant tool and uh, most of the time you will find yourself using the canvas while you're at your course because uh, I think post COVID, uh, for at least for the MBA, uh, the, the mode of teaching has become a little bit of hybrid. So even though we have daily classes, but they're in the form of a seminar, like I was just mentioning previously, where we in the seminars are more interactive rather than teaching, uh, but all the teaching materials are uploaded on Canvas. All your assignment information is uploaded on Canvas. If there is a change in the course, if there is a change in the date of the class, any notification or any announcement that needs to come from the professor to the student, it is done through Canvas. And there are various sections. You have the module section, you have the assessment sections, you have the announcement section, and it is quite intuitive in nature. So it's like you using any other app and you can have it on your laptop, you can have it on your phone, you can have access to it on the go. And for me, it's been very effective. So say for example, I need to really catch up on a reading that I haven't been able to do the previous night. I can just open up that on my canvas on my phone and on my commute to college, to the university, I can just look through it. So canvas is something that, has, that, that will make your life easy actually because you have everything on it and uh, you're not then looking at 10 different places you you're not you don't really have to uh, be very vigilant on your mailboxes because the notifications come through canvas can i the, add the something back, back sorry. sorry please do, please do add so actually, I feel like sometimes having class online is great as well because you can go and study everywhere you want. Actually, you might be bored sometimes staying in your room so you can go out and study somewhere else. And the good thing is that you also have like, you know, the recording from the class. So you can actually go and, you know, um, catch up what are the things that you missed in the class like that. So it's pretty cool. I mean, we use Canvas as, as staff members as well and just being able to connect on it um, at any time of day, but also from wherever you are. Um, I think one of the positive things about, you know, dare I say it about the pandemic is that we've all learned to work a little bit differently. Um, and it's it's that sort of like work-life balance um, from from the, the, the work side of things. So um, yeah, Canvas is something that we're quite proud of and I think the academics do use it quite well and they, and they try to keep it as engaging as possible. Um, um, but it means that I guess I see it as if, if you know, if you need to catch up on something, um, you know, if you've missed something in the class, you can go back and you can reread it and you can sort of like get it into your head a little bit more. Um, I've been getting quite a few questions about sort of things directed to the programme. Um, we are going to have um, other sessions that we'll advertise in our offer holder Facebook page, um, but also, you know, any of our offer holders that are um, maybe not a member, you, you'll be sent a link to the Facebook page. So if you want to become a member, so you get all these notifications, then, you know, just, just click into your Facebook. And um, I think there's a couple of questions that you need to respond to. And, um, and then you can, you know, you can get onto the Facebook page where we post loads of really interesting content. Um, but we'll also link you into things like this webinar. So we are going to be doing other sort of program specific um, session and also a careers and internship session. So we'll keep questions um, about programs and things for those other sessions. Um, and if you know if you've got any questions about the 
city and the region um, or, or anything more about accommodation, then, then this is absolutely the best form for that. Um, I'm just seeing some of Judah you're saying in regards to accommodation for my MBA, um, my understanding is it's available for some, from September. Um, can we get access to it in July? Um, you can speak to the accommodation team to see if you can get early access um, obviously you would then be charged from July um, in advance uh, before you join in September it, it can be possible it depends on if the rooms are available um, if the students have moved out because obviously some of our students do stay throughout the summer because we do run on a three semester basis but um, but it certainly is possible um, and if not then you can get short-term student accommodation through private providers so we can certainly help put you in touch with different places like that. I know we had a gentleman um, from Columbia on the MBA uh, this year and he started off in private student accommodation for a few months before his partner joined him and then he went into privately rented accommodation so there, there is that option as well. Um, let me see. Are you talking about Ermanson, Christine? I am talking about Ermanson, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah um, so, Samira, you've said you have a conditional offer letter. You don't want to miss out on good accommodation. Can you start applying with an unconditional? Um, you would have to have accepted an offer. Um, and I believe that once you have accepted an offer you can start applying for accommodation and um, we our accommodation team works the same as us we understand that not everyone will get their results until later on and um, closer to, to to when university starts so my understanding is so long as you have accepted um, your offer um, then you can you can put forward into accommodation and then it will be finalized once your offer is made unconditional um, but the best thing to do is to contact the accommodations team um, and I will just very quickly find a link and pop it in. They've got a, um, a web form that you can fill in um, and they do get back to you pretty quickly. So bear with me. Uh, So within the accommodation page, um, I'm just going to put the accommodation page up on the chat function there. Um, within there, there is a there is a contact us section at the bottom of the page there, Samira. So you can if you fill out the web form, um, then, you know, somebody will get back to you without a doubt um, and you can put your question to them. So I'm just wondering, do we have. Do we have any more questions at all? Uh, uh, Vaish, um, you've said thanks for the extensive session. Again, you're welcome. We do enjoy doing these. Is the university accommodation available for a short period, say for a month or two? Um, we wouldn't do such sh short term lets, um, and that is where we would um, we'd be able to advise you on to more. Um, private short-term let providers because you can get uh, short-term rentals and they're not necessarily just for students. Um, we have professionals, working professionals that come up and work in Newcastle, sometimes for extended periods of time, months at a time. Um, and rather than stay in a hotel, they prefer to have their own studio apartment. Um, and so they would go into these sort of like short term rentals. Um, but certainly what I will do is I will put um, our email address into the um into the chat again because i know that not everyone can see that if they've joined us a bit late and you can th this is the best way to contact us um because we will respond to you within a couple of days to be honest if you just bear with me sorry i'm multitasking here so i think everybody can see that OK, um, do we need to pay any deposit for accommodation? Um, Alice, when you when you booked your accommodation, did you have to pay a deposit at all? You're on mute. <laughs> OK, um, it was like um, 
uh, I think it's a long time ago. I'm not sure. I don't think I have to. Yeah, I don't think I have to, but um, I kind of pay. I kind of pay the whole amount. I think at that time. <laughs> yeah. I think that was yeah, like. But, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two case. Either you pay like the whole rent, mm -hmm. or you just like pay in installments. So if you pay for installment, yeah, you but, basically um, has to pay mm -hmm. for deposit. Yeah, but um, they also have like um the guarantor or something, so they they might not ask for a deposit because they have the person mm -hmm. who they ask money for anyway. Yeah, uh, Deborah, what was your experience? Because you're in Boston Court. Yes, yeah, so uh, I had opted for the installment option, the four installment, and uh, I did not have to pay anything upfront, but every quarterly, uh. I have an invoice sent to me with a payment link and uh, it's pretty st straightforward. So uh, I do not have to pay anything upfront. It's just after every quarter is when I receive the invoice and I have to make my payment because I chose for the installment type. Yeah. Yeah, generally, um, generally, what we find is you you wouldn't you wouldn't be asked to pay a deposit. What would happen is, once you join um, university, you enroll into the university. Obviously, you've picked your accommodation by this point. You'd then be given a finance plan, um, and like Runa says, you can either choose to pay in installments um, or you can choose to pay upfront. Um, but the accommodation will give you will give you those choices. So um, it's it's not like when you're um, confirming your place at the university. Um, but if you were to go into privately rented accommodation, um, then the likelihood is you'd be asked for a, a deposit or a guarantor. Um, and if you went through an estate agency, a letting agency, um, and you went through a private landlord, then um, they're legally allowed to ask you for a maximum of six weeks deposit, um, which has to be protected in a government scheme, um, um, your deposit would get refunded to you. Um, one thing I would advise is that they can, um, and, and this is sometimes the issue with, um, with going into private accommodation, uh, they can remove some of your deposit uh, if you've damaged the property, um, if, if they are gonna have the property professionally cleaned, um, then they can hold back some of the deposit uh, from you to pay for that cleaning. But that is all written into your contract. Um, and so when you're, when, whatever, the form of accommodation you decide to take, um, a very, very important piece of information is do read the terms and conditions of your contract to understand what you are liable for as a tenant, but also what your landlord is responsible for doing as well. It's really important to keep you to keep you safe. Um, I'm just going to go through. So, Serhat, should you apply for accommodation, whether your offer is conditional or unconditional? Um, if you've if you're if you've been made an offer from the university and you've accepted that offer, then you should receive um, an email from accommodation. Um, and at that point, that is when you can start applying for your accommodation. So, if you've received that email, um, then absolutely, you know, start applying. Um, if you if you don't make your grades and you can't join us in the end um then don't uh you know don't worry you won't have been charged your your accommodation will simply be freed up for someone else so yes if you have received an email to start making that application then do make that application um Mav Judah, why would someone choose private over the university accommodation is it cheaper um on the face of it sometimes um if you are Looking at privately rented accommodation and um, I know you so I, I assume that you probably wouldn't want to take a house share um, with people that you didn't know but there's obviously two different types you can you can go into a house share where you will literally, literally rent a room and you will share the facilities like the kitchen the bathroom the living space with the other people that live in that house um, the headline rent that you will often see is for the room only um, and so that can be a lot cheaper so you might be looking at 80 to 90 pounds per week depending on where that room is based and where that house is based what the location is and at that cheap you're probably looking quite far from the university um so then you would have to consider your your bills on top of 
um, on top of your room. So that could be gas, electricity, Wi-Fi, water. Um, and if you're sharing a property, then there is the issue of splitting those bills. Um, and if you're living with strangers and somebody likes playing on their computer all night and using all the electricity and then someone else likes having really long hot baths and they're using all the water um, and you're actually you know you're not doing those things and you're out at, at university and you're studying but the bills are still split equally but you're not using all of those different facilities then you know you might not feel that it's particularly fair that you're paying the same sort of like split amount as as the people that you're sharing with so there's those sorts of things to take into consideration the good thing about university accommodation is the price that you see is the price that you pay um and you know all of your bills are included with, whether that's wi-fi um your electricity and your water and it doesn't matter sort of you know how much you use it it's all included in that price um some people choose private accommodation simply because they want to live in an apartment by themselves some people bring their families to come and live with them and so they would want to have a house or a flat. So it's very much an individual um, accommodation. Um, Ragav, what is the minimum contract length for university? Um, we do, we tend to work on an academic year, um, whether that's the 40 or the 52 weeks. Um, and so, but each, if you go into the accommodation page, um, and I think, and I linked that just previously, if you click onto the accommodation page, um, then you'll be able to see that each accommodation has different contract lengths. Um, and the, we, the only time we do shorter uh, contracts is for um, where we might have an exchange student, um, but if you're applying for postgraduate study, then um, then you would you would have to sign up to a full year's worth of, of accommodation. Um, Mav Judah, if you've applied for the family ones, but you haven't heard from them yet, I mean the uh, what I will say about the accommodation team is now is the time of year that everyone is applying for accommodation. Um, so if you are concerned about them, do click onto the link um, that I popped back in the chat just um, a few moments ago um, to to find out if if they do have any availability. Um, but again, if if you want to get in touch through the MBA inbox, we can always put that question to them and see what they say, so that at least we can get a response for you. Um, Andrew, if you're wishing to pay in installments, how many times will we pay if we're having a 40 weeks accommodation? Is it charged monthly, quarterly or semi-annual? Um, Runa, I'm going to come to you on that. Um, what is your experience with your um, installments for your accommodation in Bosdon Court? It's pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, every uh, So you don't have to do anything if you've already signed up for the installment option. Uh, the accommodation team knows and periodically you're going to be sent an email uh, saying that your payment is due on a certain date with an invoice and that invoice also has a link through which you can pay. You can choose from multiple various different modes of payment. Either you can pay to the university directly through a bank transfer or it's an online link that is generated which you can pay through directly from your bank. So I typically use that link uh, and I go to an online payment gateway through which I then pay it through my bank, which is the Lloyds Bank here. Uh, and that's about it. You will get a receipt and I hold on to the receipt for you know, any miscommunication because I'm, I like to hold on to documents as long as I need them for and I keep the receipts. So and then once you have the next payment period, you're going to receive another invoice. And that's how it's done. Thanks, Trina. That was really helpful. Um, Sarah Hatt, we've got a, um, so you've asked questions to Alice and Nice. Um, your opinions about postgraduate accommodation, which ones did you choose? Um, uh, and if, if you mind sharing that. So Alice, I'll come to you first because you're on my screen first. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I chose the Castle one. It's a private accommodation. Mm -hmm. And I chose this place. It's basically I didn't have a choice left because I was late. Like I was very, very late. <laughs> Actually, I was like um, uh, I was late for a week for the semester. But yeah, it was so late. So the nice plates are all gone. So I don't really have any choice. 
but so um but it's not far from the school yeah so i just choose this place that's good so your message would be if you have the option to try and get in early yes <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> well actually um if i if i came early i would go for um either the wheel or birthday i think it's partner with the university right um, what's the name of Downing it Sorry. student i think yeah. it's the wheel and birthday Downing student yes yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. just next yeah. door <clears throat> yeah if i if i could if i came earlier and i have more choice i would choose um the one that partner with the university because um now when I'm in private accommodation, when I need help, they don't really, um, um, you know, it's less like, um, if you, okay, it's just- we can't, um, we, we, we can't really help with things where we don't have a partnership yes, with the accommodation. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, that's what I'm trying to yeah. say, yeah. So, yeah, but I was so late, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> okay, so nice. What would you say? Um, where where is it that you've chosen to to live? What are your opinions about your postgraduate accommodation? Okay, so basically, I live at the View, which is the one that next to the business school, the closest mm -hmm. one. So the reason why I chose is because it's like two minute walking to the business school, which is great. But at the same time, I would say the downside of private accommodation is that because you're gonna leave with um the undergrad. Also, people from different university, for example, like Northampton University. So basically, you're gonna have like it's it's good that you have like a lot of friends from different places, undergrad as well. But it's really noisy sometimes. It's like your schedule for the postgrad and undergrad is totally different times, right? So it's kind of like very really noisy, and you cannot really focus much on your work. So you have to go to library instead to working on that. So that probably might be the con of that too. Okay, so so perhaps it's better if you can choose accommodation that is for postgraduates only because the students are a little bit older. The undergraduates, we know they do like to have a little bit more of a party lifestyle because they've got a bit of that longer time to study. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. We're we're over sort of nearly 40 minutes over our, our sort of like specified end time. And, and I am afraid that we're going to have to pull this to a close. I am stunned and astonished and thrilled at how many questions we had and how many people joined us. So so thank you so, so very much um, to our amazing business ambassadors uh, who always come out with, you know, with some of the best sort of advice and guidance. And I always learn so much when I, you know, when I listen to you talk. So thank you again um, for assisting us with this. Um, to anyone, any of our guests that have that have joined us today, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and join us. Like I said, we are going to be hosting um, a couple of other sessions on a couple of different topics. Um, I'm going to put our email address into the um, the inbox just once again there. Um, and you know, if you do want to contact us, please do stay in touch through through that email address. We will get back to you. Um, but you know, it's it's been really great. You know, and I hope that we do see some, if not all of you, in September. Um, we, we would love to see your faces when you join. So thank you very much, and um, bye bye. Bye, bye, Christy. Thank you. Uh, happy to help. Bye-bye and thank you. Oh.